Oh, it's cool. So if you had um, lab yet, kind of cool dissecting that eyeball. If you haven't had lab yet, you get to perform the coolness today. So pay attention when you um, dissect your eyeball to all of the different parts. Yes? Correct. So we left off talking about the lens, if I recall. And the lens is one of the things that's going to help bend the light. I keep talking about bending the light. The cornea is going to bend the light. The light flowing through fluids in the anterior chamber, that aqueous humor, is going to bend the light. And then the lens is going to bend the light. Bend the light to where? Yeah, that place in the retina where we have the highest visual acuity. What's that called? The fovea centralis and that macula lutea region. So the lens is made up of what we call crystalline proteins. When you dissect your eyeballs, make sure you cut the lens in half. Oh, he didn't tell us to do that. He didn't? Oh, jeez. just grab it. Yeah, it's like a marble. But if you cut it in half, it looks like an onion. There's layers, and those crystalline proteins wrap themselves in a circle to form the lens. It's hard in your specimens. How come? Because the eye is dead. So it gets harder. Just like the cornea is opaque in your dissection specimens. In a live cow's eye, it's what? Clear. Hmm? The cow is dead and so is its eyeball. Yes? So the lens is more pliable. And those suspensatory ligaments in the ciliary zonules help to get more bending going on so that we can focus in on things very fine. Get that light to where it needs to go. So understand it's made of those crystalline proteins. Now what happens if that, that bends the light becomes distorted? Yeah, exactly. You're, gonna, you're going to interrupt that flow of information to the photoreceptors, and you're going to disrupt vision. Remember, I have to get that message to the occipital lobe in the back of the brain in order for me to see. Because remember, that's where I see. What's that? Cataract. That's a cataract. So basically, that lens we think of as a window almost becomes dirty. When you have glasses and they're really dirty, can you see clearly through them? No, because they bend the light in different directions and they distort the eventual view that you see. So that is a cataract. Now when we talk about light, light is made up of different wavelengths. There's many different wavelengths that compose light, but you can only see what we call visible light. How come? How come you can only see in the visible range? Why can't you see ultraviolet light or infrared light? You don't have photoreceptors that pick up that message. So the message is always being sent, but you don't have receptors to receive the message. Other and they're not at it. You know, from a nanometer wavelengths to about 700 nanometer wavelengths. And again, that is the visible light range. And they range from blue, green, and red cones. And combinations of these different cones, because cones are the photoreceptors for what? Color, are going to give us all the ones in between. Do you ever, uh, in class or in school, talk about something called a primary color. And then if I mix a bunch of different crayons up, I can make all the other colors. That's kind of like how your photoreceptors work. Yeah, so we have red, green, and blue and combinations of those guys firing. And different patterns give us what we visualize as all the colors in between. 
And those colors, again, are Roy G. Biv. We talked about those last class. And they fall in this visible light range. So understand it's between 400 and 700 nanometers. And that is visible light. So when I see colors, they're actually reflecting some of these wavelengths back into my eye, firing off the photoreceptor specific for that wavelength, sending the message to where? that visual cortex and that's why we see the colors that we see so if we have problems with the chemistry of vision in any of these photoreceptors I'm gonna have problems seeing the colors that they would let me see what do we call that colorblind and different people have different forms of color blindness depending on where their chemistry issue is so, when we see white, all light reflects off. When we see black or brown, not much is being reflected off. It's being what? Absorbed. So again, we mentioned in class, uh, last class, in the summertime, you don't want to absorb all those light rays. What do you want to do? You want to reflect them. So that's why you tend to wear white in the summer. In the winter, I want to suck up all those rays that I possibly can to keep me warm. So we tend to wear darker colors in the winter time. Also, refraction. Remember, those wavelengths have to travel through air and go into your eye. But if I have something in water, they're going to bend a little bit differently. When we talk about the bending of light, and remember, it's important, the cornea has to help it bend, those fluids have to help it bend, the lens has to help it bend to hit the point where it needs to hit. Things are going to travel more towards the perpendicular. Everybody knows what perpendicular is, right? Straight up and down. When they travel through the air. When they travel through the water, they bend a little bit off perpendicular. So when you look at something like the spoon, it's not really broken, is it? It looks like it because of the way those wavelengths are traveling to hit you in the eye. So the top looks more towards the perpendicular and the bottom looks a little bit off, yes? It's not broken, it's just the way those wavelengths are traveling through the medium, water or air. Yep. And they, their brains actually calculate the angle of, I think it's refraction. Yep. And your brain does a lot of this calculating for you, your perception of things. When you're little and you watch a little baby first learning something or seeing something, a lot of times they'll grab at things and totally be off the mark. So what do you think you do as you get older? You learn that's that wherever that is in space is totally off the mark, I need to move over a little bit or I need to move to the left or to the right. So you compensate for that. Your brain compensates for that. And it does that with the information of those two eyeballs. So they talk a little bit about refraction. Focal points, near images versus far images. We have to bend the light a little bit differently depending on what we're looking at. The other thing that's going to control the light coming in, besides all of the guys that bend them, is who? Who else controls the light besides the bending portion of the light? The iris. That's going to control what? The focus. But it's going to control with respect to light. Yeah, how much or how little light comes in. So focusing distance when I look at something in the distance, I'm looking at an image where light needs to be bent. Don't forget, who's going to help me bend light? We have the cornea, the lens, and the lens coming in and going out is going to give me a different bend to the light. 
When the lens starts to become less elastic, we're not going to be able to see as well either. Nystagmus. Has anybody ever heard of nystagmus? That's old people vision. That's where you have to go and get what at the doctor's. When your arms aren't long enough anymore. Yeah, those reading glasses. So they talk a little bit about distance vision. And a normal distance visioned person is said to have an emotropic eye. So the focal points in this diagram show us places of highest visual acuity, show us where light is passing, and that lens in the center is going to bend that light. And the image is actually inverted when it hits the retina because of the light being bent by the lens. So why don't I see everything upside down and backwards? Your brain compensates for that in the processing of those images. So the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system is going to help with activation when we talk about lens, passing image, the sympathetic input, and those ciliary muscles are going to tighten to get that image exactly where it needs to be. On what area again? And that's kind of a uh, deceiving view, because it sort of looks like it's going to the optic disc. But where is it actually going to? Fovea centralis in the macular region. So parasympathetic is going to do some different things for that lens. So when I look at an object close, the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system is going to help bend the light just right so it hits that place. Again, ciliary muscles are going to help control lens. And lens, also a muscle, is going to help control the amount of light that enters for you to see. The ultimate goal is to get all of those wavelengths that are coming in right to the fovea centralis, and we call that the focal plane. So think of us trying to get all of these wavelengths to their tiniest point when I hit that. That's the highest point of visual acuity. And where, think about all the wavelengths that are coming in my field of view, because my field of view goes like this. I can still see my hands. OK? But the sharpest is where? Yes? So you're in my sharpest view. I can still see everybody else. But the image of you and the light waves that bounce off of you are hitting that sharpest point. Everything else is kind of hitting all around, and I don't see it as clearly. So emotropic. What happens when I can't get that wavelength, those wavelengths of light to the right point? And actually, when the wavelengths come in, that perfect point is just ahead of where it needs to be. Now, there could be many reasons for that. Your light bending apparatus might be off. Remember, cornea, lens. Or your eyeball might be just a little bit too long. When my uh, daughter was little and we had to go to the eye doctors, the eye doctor said, your eyeball is not shaped like a basketball like it should be. It's shaped like a football. So that's why we need glasses to do what? Yep. So we change the focal point by using a lens that's going to do what? It's going to elongate so that point hits where it should. That's called a myopic eye. And you are nearsighted. You're nearsighted because 
you can see, well, that usually people say you can see things close up or near, but you can't see things far away. But it's really that image comes near and not to that focal point. What if I go the other way? What if my eyeballs are a little too short? What if the wavelength is too long? So by the way, to correct the myopic eye, what, what kind of lens do I use? It's something called a concave lens. And when you look at it, the glass is like this. That's going to help lengthen those wavelengths. If you look at glasses, you can see that the glass is two different types. Like I have bifocal, so I have both on there. The other one they mention is something called a hyperopic eye. So uncorrected, we see that the wavelengths are too long. That visual acuity, that point is actually past where it should be. It doesn't physically do that, but hopefully you get the point. So what's hitting the fovea centralis is going to be blurry. How do we correct that? We shorten the wavelengths, and that's a convex lens. So know the difference between an emetropic, a myopic, and a hyperopic eye. Yes? There is. It, yeah, there is. Yeah, some people, because of the correction that they need, like some people with astigmatisms, for example, you have to get it just right. You have to, you have to bend the light differently right above that place where it's being disrupted. Yeah, so they have weighted ones, but sometimes they're not as effective. Yeah, a couple people. Yeah. So a couple of things I want to point out about getting that point to where it needs to be. They talk a little bit on page 556 about accommodation. So lens constricts, pupils constrict or lens lengthens, and two eyeballs converge on objects. When something is close, what happens to your eyes? Yeah, they seem to go closer. If I bring my finger and want to keep it in focus and I bring it to my nose, what's happening to my eyes? I'm going cross-eyed because of the convergence reflex. So um, again, many people over 50 or around the age of 50 or kind of in the 50 region have something called presbyopia. And that's the old people vision. I, I said it wrong earlier. I apologize. So we call that literally old people vision. This is where I have problems with one of my bending members, the lens. It starts to get a little stiff. It's not going to be as pliable. And where that's going to affect is the close-up vision. Because if you look at the correction, we see that convex lenses are going to help lengthen. Okay. So convergence of the eyeballs, very important. Constriction of the pupil, very important. Movement of the eyes so convergence can take place, very important for vision. So when the closer the object gets, the more convergence we see until there's a point where I can't converge anymore and what happens to the object I'm looking at. You, you did this in lab too, didn't you? At some point, you're going to bring something close enough, so what happens to it? It starts to do what? It gets blurry. You can no longer compensate with convergence on getting that image clear. So photoreceptors, just a little. Now, in the book, they go over um, a little bit more detail the physiology of vision. So I'm not going to get too, too crazy on that. I want you to know a couple of main things. Down at the bottom of the photoreceptors, 
the part that sits in the pigmented layer of the retina, we're going to find little bags of chemicals, visual pigments. And you're constantly making new visual pigments and packing them in these little disc-like sacks. Is that what all the little rings are? Yep. So they're little discs. Similar to if you took a biology class when you talked about chloroplasts and you saw the little grana packed up like little pancakes inside those chloroplasts. Similar structure we're talking about here. So you constantly regenerate those. Where do you make most of your little visual pigment packages in a day? Do you know when you do most of this work? When you're sleeping. You ever stay up a long time, way past your normal bedtime, and start seeing things that aren't there? That ever happened to you driving home really late at night? Oh, you're like, there was nothing there. Oh, I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye. It's because you're not giving those visual pigments enough time to regenerate themselves. So it's important because they're part of the whole chemistry or physiology of vision. So we find these guys down at the bottom, and those vig visual pigments are created. And then as they age, they get phagocytized away. As we age, that process doesn't become as efficient anymore. And that's why sometimes as we age, our vision is affected. So. Well, think about you making new, because these are older at the bottom. So these little bags of chemicals, as they get old, they have to be thrown out. And the new ones are going to get stacked on the top. Because this is the cell, right? Cell bodies up here, a lot of work, you know, protein synthesis, transcription and translation and all that good stuff. Everybody remembers that stuff, right? That's all happening up here. Golgi apparatus, all of those nice little endoplasmic reticulum. So when I create the chemicals under the direction of my DNA, I am then going to send them to the endoplasmic reticulum. And then I might push them off to who? For packaging and shipping. The Golgi apparatus that will create a nice little sack around it. And then they'll move here. Yes? So these are the old, and these are the new. And as they get too old, we want to get rid of them, because we don't want them taking up a lot of space. So this is the trash, out with the old, in with the new. Yes? So rods, cones, different message, different intensity, different interpretation. Cones, color. Cones have a more diverse group of chemicals in their discs than rods do. Rods also are going to have bipolar cells that service many different rods, whereas cones have their own private little bipolar cell to send message for processing in the cerebral cortex. The purple's the cones, and the uh, yellow are the rods. I'm mean, excuse me. The purple is the rods, and the yellow is the cones. Yeah. Hello. Say that one more time. What? So the purple is rods or cones? Rods. So because of that, we get higher visual acuity with cones than we do with rods. Rods tend to have a more fuzzy view of the world. Uh, they talk a little bit under comparing rods and cones and cone vision in your textbook about seeing with dim light. At night, when you go out, after accommodation has taken place, you can see what's out there. But is it really clear and crisp? No, it's kind of fuzzy. 
And actually, you see it a little better if you don't look straight at it. Why is that? Because if I look straight at it, where is that image going? To the fovea centralis, trying to stimulate the cones. Is it going to stimulate the cones at that intensity? Nope. But if I turn just a little bit, I'm going to get more of it stimulating the rods that surround that fovea region. Also, if it's moving, I can see it better than if it stands still. If it stands still, it kind of washes away in the background. Again, because the light is too low in intensity. Yes? I don't really understand the outer segment is so deep inside of the pigment layer. How could the discs actually receive the light? Remember, we're not talking about a brick wall here. We're talking about organelles inside a cell. Why is it you can see things under the microscope? Those are a few cell layers thick. How come, you, how come light passes through them? Yeah, it's pigmented, but think, it's only a cell. It's one cell layer thick, or two cells layer thick. So we're not talking about thick, right? Does that help? So um, remember, light has to pass by all those guys before we get this reaction going on. So blue cones respond maximally to a wavelength of 420 nanometers. Green, 530 nanometers. And red, 560 nanometers. So all the combinations of these guys firing off in different sequence and everything in between is what gives us all of the different colors that we see besides the red, the green, and the blue. So one of the things that's important for the chemistry of vision is something called vitamin A. And sometimes when we have problems with getting enough vitamin A, especially in third world countries, vitamin A is an issue can actually cause blindness because it dip, uh, disrupts the chemistry of vision. Sometimes in non-third world countries, we develop problems with vision. And it might be problems with vision at night. And that's where my nystagmus comes in. So night blindness. And, I, and sometimes that happens with age. I'm starting to experience that myself can be a problem. So the first um, player in the chemistry of vision, and we can see our little discs up there showing us where all of this chemistry is taking place, consists of two major components. One is called retinal, and one is called opsin. The two work together for the physiology of vision. So once these guys come together in a certain, um, what's the word I want? Compound, thank you. We're going to fire off the receptors and start that nerve impulse going. So on page 560 in your textbook, figure 15.16, we see a general outline of the chemistry of vision. One of the things that's very important is that retinal and the making of that retinal in a chemical reaction. The bleaching of that pigment and then the reforming of that pigment is what's going to fire off our receptors for vision. So if you look on page 560 and 561, under that diagram, you see a nice little outline, one, two, and three, that describe pigment synthesis, pigment bleaching, and then the regeneration of the pigment, so we can start it all over again, is basically what I want you to know for the physiology of vision. This diagram outlines it nicely. So light transduction moving in, that's sort of our message 
That is the what for this sense? Light. Stimulus. Where's the receptor? Yeah, it's that, com it's that compound containing the 11 cis retinal. And once I excite that and start this going, a second messenger system is going to be set up. Now, we talked a little bit about second messenger systems way back when in chapter, I think it was chapter 3 or chapter 4. And we're going to talk more about second messenger systems when we talk about hormones and how they affect what's going on in the cell. But this second messenger system is what's going to fire off those neurons to send message for processing in the brain. When we talked about firing off neurons before, what was it that caused thresholds to be reached? Hmm? Well, depolarization is the result. But what caused the change in charge on the inside of the plasma membrane of a neuron to cause sodium? Sodium doing what? Coming in. Normally, when a cell is at rest, and this is all stuff you have to know, when a cell is at rest, the membrane is what? It's polarized, yes? More sodium on the outside than on the inside. So I have to set up for depolarization, and this is the way it happens inside the photoreceptors. So when we talked about neurons before, I had a neurotransmitter, and it came in contact with a receptor, and the receptor just happened to be the sodium-potassium pump, and bam, yes? Bam. But in this case, it takes a little bit longer. With the second messenger system, I have to have a G protein, which sort of runs itself along. Oh, wait a minute. Do I have that? I know. I just untied it. I guess I don't have it. Look on page uh, 561. And you see these little cute little... Um, I'm going to take my shoes off. Is that Hopefully my feet don't stink and the front row won't, won't have to smell my feet. All right, so up there we see light, that nice little stimulus that's running across. And then we see the receptor. That's the purple guy. That's that guy there in the plasma membrane. And he changes in shape when light hits him. He's then going to sort of give a push to the G protein. The G protein is going to be on the move. It's going to start to move across the inner portion of the membrane until it comes in contact with an enzyme. That's the other little guy that's running along in the picture above this diagram in your book. When they combine, they're going to activate some chemicals called GMP. The activation of GMP and GMP now doing its job is going to be the formation of the second messenger in the system. So let's see why we call it a second messenger system. So we have first stimulus, G protein that's going to hand off some message, and an enzyme that's going to help me form a second messenger, which is then going to cause changes in that very familiar sodium potassium pump receptor that we talked about before. Think of change shape. So just like when we talked about um, muscle contraction, and we talked about calcium coming in contact with troponin. Troponin change shape. When light comes in contact with the receptor that contains the 11 cis retinal, it's going to change shape, and it's going to give a kick to the G protein. The G protein can now tumble along the inside. And when it comes in contact with the enzyme, 
it's going to form another complex. Does that make sense? Kind of? Look at the little guys running along. They, they are actually cute. I wish I had them in my PowerPoint or presentation. So that's how we get the whole ball rolling with as far as, far as photoreceptors go for depolarization and sending message along. And remember, once this depolarizes, where does it send message to? And on this diagram in, on page 562 in your textbook, figure 15.18, it shows us what happens during night and during day. The chemistry is a little bit different. This is where I'm not going to get crazy because they go into the specifics of light and dark, and I'm not going to get too crazy about that. Um, yes? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. From the G protein to the enzyme. Remember, when I talk about enzyme, yep, that, this complex is going to activate GMP. So it takes cyclic GMP and turns it into GMP. Yes? And that reaction, cyclic GMP, is going to help with the whole depolarization. So remember enzymes. What's at the end of an enzyme? ACE, ASE. Yes? It's called phosphodiesterase. So remember, all of these events need to take place in order for depolarization in the photoreceptor to take place. Then message is going to be sent the same way it did when we talked about neuron to neuron. Neurotransmitter is going to be released, handoff message to bipolar cell, bipolar cell to ganglion cell, and I take my trip to the brain. In the light, the reaction is a little bit different. And again, I'm not going to get crazy about that. I just want you to understand that phototransduction and the capturing of light and the bleaching event. So it's, it's because of the chemistry and the way it takes place. In the dark, it's a little bit different than when it's light, yes? When you go from the dark to the light, what happens to what you see? It, it what? What does it look like? You, you go to the movies during the day, and then you go outside, and yeah. Everything looks what? Really, really white, doesn't it? Because I have to switch over to the different types of chemistry, and that takes a little while to happen. It's sort of bleached out, right? Because of the two different ways chemistry happens in the light versus dark. Same thing happens when I'm trying to adapt to the darkness. If you're used to sitting in the light and some nasty person goes over and shuts the lights off and leaves you in the dark, you, you're suddenly blind. You can't see anything. Yet everything is black because you've got to switch over to the dark reaction that we just looked at. It, take, yeah, it takes a little while, right, for adaptation to take place, but then you can see things eventually in the darkness. So that's what they talk about under light adaptation and dark adaptation. So nyctalopia's night blindness. Who's responsible for that? Problems with the rods. And who might be responsible for that? Vitamin A. So vitamin A deficiencies. And again, in third world countries, one of the problems one of the big problems with vision is vitamin A deficiencies. They've actually developed a rice called golden rice. And golden rice contains more vitamin A. Because a lot of third world countries, what's their diet, what's a staple in their diet? Rice. Grasshoppers. The next thing we look at is visual pathways. Remember, there's two eyeballs. There's two occipital lobes, 
And both of them share in the process of processing for vision. Each eye sends message to both sides of the brain in different patterns for vision. So when I lose an eye, I have a lot of compensating to do because I'm used to getting information from two eyes for the processing of vision. So not only do I have areas that we find in the occipital lobe that are going to help me process vision, but we also have areas in the temporal lobe that help me process for vision. And these guys are going to help me with depth perception. So remember we talked about tracks in that midbrain region. If you look at the optic nerve, we see that the optic nerve branches at something called the optic what? Chiasma. And you remember that when you dissected your brain last semester. It's pretty prominent, isn't it? And this is where the switch happens. So that's the switch gate that then sends messages from one eye or the other through the midbrain regions, and again, I'm not going to make you memorize the midbrain regions, to the optic radiation in the occipital lobe. This is our primary visual cortex, and this is going to help us see. So again, this is where we see. Which of our cranial nerves is responsible for sending messages to places where we see? Yeah, optic nerve. Cranial nerve what? Two. So depth perception is important so I can understand where things are in a three-dimensional space. And because we have convergent vision, that helps us do that very efficiently. Some, some animals don't. Horses, for example. Their visual pathways, the ones that cross in the front, are very, very small. Because where are their eyes? They're on either side of their head. So they still have binocular vision, but it's not nearly as complex as yours. So they have lots of problems with depth perception. That's one of the reasons why horses are so skittish. Because it's hard for them to know exactly how close or how far things are away. And they do this a lot. It, it's it's my, uh, I can't eye coordination. Same same reason you have a hard time walking down the stairs when you're a baby. Well, like you know how like if you have like apparently a dog on like a, like their dog house, they won't jump because they think it's a lot yeah. Than yeah. Yeah. Theirs isn't as bad because their eyes are a little bit more forward on the face. But like bunnies, rabbits, um, some lizards. Uh, horses. Horses are the best example because they're so far away. So they have very little crossover in their uh, frontal vision. And you have lots. So that helps you with depth perception. So primary visual cortex is where I'm processing information. We do get some help from the temporal and parietal and frontal, lobes air, front, frontal lobe areas, kind of telling us what and where. So when I look at something, there's two things I have to figure out if I'm going to interact with that something. First of all, what is it? Second of all, where is it? So these guys are all going to work together to help me figure out the what and the where. You don't have this in your book. Don't worry about it. Everybody good with vision? Do you see clearly now? The next sense. We don't, we're not talking about photoreceptors here because the stimulus is no longer light. The next sense, or sense says, that go hand in hand are chemoreceptors. They are fired off. Their stimulus is some sort of chemical, something dissolved in some sort of fluid. This is your sense of what? Your sense of smell. Not smell. Let's get scientific. Olfactory. Which cranial nerve? Cranial nerve one. 
So again, we're talking about this almost the exact same thing we just talked about with vision, except now we have different receptors and they're in a different place and they're stimulated by different things. So where do we find olfactory receptors in the human body? Yeah, we find them in the upper nasal cavity, right up at the top. Because when you breathe in, air comes in and guess where it goes? comes up and then bounces around. Why does it bounce around? To warm it up. Why do I have to warm it up? <laughs> so it doesn't freeze your lungs. Because more efficient air exchange happens closer to body temperature. So you're going to start warming up. Warming up. What happens to molecules when you warm them up? They move faster. So in order for a more efficient gas exchange to happen, we got to start warming those molecules right as we bring them in. And how are we going to do that? Bang them around. So that's why you have all these little folds in your nasal conche, so we can bounce the air around. So it's going to come in, and it's going to hit this area first. So when I smell something, can I smell it better if I take a big deep smell of it. Why, why do we instinctively do that? Somebody buys you roses and you're all excited and what do you do? You go and smell them. What do you do? You go stick your nose in there and you go, oh, don't those smell nice. So we do that instinctively because we know the nice air that's coming in. The more of it we get in, the more smell molecules we're going to get in. And those smell molecules are going to have to be dissolved in some sort of fluid. What is it? Mucus! How attractive. A thin layer of mucus that covers the upper nasal cavity is where we're going to find what we call olfactory cilia. And this is basically what? What do you think it is? This is a Receptor. This is part of the nervous system. It's a sensory receptor. So what do you think that end is? Dendrites. Very good. No, it's not a trick question. You always think I'm trying to trick you. Always. No, you trick yourself. You always say, how many times does he say that in a class? You're trying to trick us. It's like, no. All right. It's, yeah, and, and because sometimes it's easy. So those are dendrites. And remember, just like we talked about when we talked about the nervous system, there was receptors on the surface of my dendrites for stimulus. So there's receptors on the surface of the olfactory cilia for stimulus. And you have a whole bunch of different receptors. I think there's a quote in the book. There's like 400 different um, molecules in smells, it's in there somewhere. Yeah, so there's, there's 400 different genes in your genetic material, 400 different combinations that'll set off smells. Taste, boring. How many? Anybody know? Five. Smells? They're hard to research because there's so many different receptors, or I should say um, protein receptors in the dendrites that can have so many different combinations for smell. So smell's a big, huge palate, tastes kind of boring. When you taste something, you actually use these guys to help you figure out what it is. So taste is actually 80% smell. You know that when you have a cold. When you have a cold, what happens to that mucus layer? <sighs> Becomes very thick. So instead of being up here, it's way down here. So the smell molecules come in. They do their thing. They bounce around. But by the time they hit the dendrites, they're so dispersed through the mucus the concentration of them doesn't allow this cell to fire off. So you can't smell anything. So everything tastes like bleh. Yes? So the receptors are located in 
a group of cells called supporting cells. This is epithelial tissue. So those supporting cells are typically columnar epithelium that are going to help hold in place the receptors for your sense of smell. And again, those guys are called olfactory receptors held in by supporting cells. When you look at it under the microscope, and I think we're going to look at them next week, look for the epithelial layer because that's what you should be visualizing. So with the help of the olfactory gland helping me produce that mucus that I need to dissolve things and the epithelium holding everybody in place, we can then fire off the receptors when stimulus comes in and send that message where? Where do I smell? All right, I have to process in the brain. So through the olfactory tract, I'm then going to be sending that message to the brain for processing. You smell with your brain, that's right. So hundreds of different chemicals can fire off receptors in hundreds of different combinations. We have 400 different smell genes. And one of the things about these two senses that doesn't follow the rules of any other nervous system stuff that we've been talking about throughout this entire course is I have the ability to make more olfactory receptors. Did you know that? Every time you smell something strong, sometimes it's not this that's going on. Sometimes it's actually pain. Chilies, for example. Ammonia. Onions. That's actually a pain response that you're sensing when you smell those things. And they can actually damage and kill off olfactory receptors. Yep. Yeah, and your eyes start to run. That's why, because that is toxic. Onion juice, chlorine, certain chemicals in our environment can do it too. So look, huh? Oh, chill and chilies, nasty stuff. Yeah. So you're not actually tasting. You're feeling pain when you eat chilies. What's the awkward question? People that have um, drug addictions, they, cocaine and stuff like that, they destroy all of those receptors, correct? They destroy some of them, yeah. Wow. And luckily, we have the ability, because of these cells in the, in the, the epithelial layer, the olfactory epithelium, we can regenerate them. But if they damage them too much, they will lose their sense of smell. Um, sometimes different um, head injuries can cause people to lose their sense of smell as well. But we have the ability to regenerate those olfactory receptor cells. Of course, with anything that we're going to say throughout the entire rest of the course, as we get older, what happens? Yeah, we don't, we're not as good at regenerating things as we used to when we're younger. So as we age, our sense of smell might diminish slightly. But that is following, not following the rules of the neurons that we've learned in the past. So fibers of the trigeminal nerve, which is cranial nerve who? Four, four. Five is going to help with bringing message for processing in the cerebral cortex. So. Just like we talked about with our sense of sight, we have a second messenger system responsible for sending the message, firing off those neurons and sending them down the olfactory tract. So a receptor comes in contact with the smell molecules. Their fancy name is the odorant. We're going to change shape, give G protein a kick. He's going to start moving along and come in contact with an enzyme. In this case, the enzyme's name is adenylate cyclase. We're going to meet this guy again when we talk about hormones, because it's a similar enzyme responsible for the second messenger system of a water-soluble hormone, along with a couple of other guys. 
Adenylate cyclase will help to form the second messenger. In this case, his name is cyclic AMP or CAMP. And when that comes in contact with the sodium potassium pump, boom. Yes? I have to have enough of these to reach what in order for that to fire off? Yeah. If I only have a couple of smell molecules in the region, or they get too dispersed because they have to work their way through way too many mucus, am I going to have a depolarization take place? No. So, another thing that can happen with these guys is something called adaptation. <clears throat> so going back to the plasma membrane of these cells, you do this all the time and you might not even know that you're doing it. Anybody use the cologne in the morning, a little perfume, a little smell nice before we go out the door? <laughs> so you give a little squirt and you're like, ah, oh, this smells nice. But then after a few minutes, do you smell it anymore? Believe me, you still smell. Don't squirt again. No re-squirting. Stop the re-squirting. Because what happens? You choke everybody around you. One squirt will do you. Believe me, you smell wonderful. What happens to you is you stop smelling that doesn't mean the molecules have gone away. The odorants are still there. But your cells are like, geez, if I keep firing off, I'm going to become damaged. So I need to protect myself. So what they can actually do is internalize those receptors. They'll keep a few out there. And if you re-squirt, you'll still smell it, but you're putting way more molecules in the air. It's a protection mechanism for the receptors so that they don't have to keep firing off over and over again. <laughs> Correct, because the receptors are like, whoo, okay, I can go back out again. Then when you come back in and those molecules excite it, you smell it again. You know, when you use air fresheners in your home or you light a candle, Sometimes, I, I'm a big candle person. I love the smelly candle. My husband is going to kill me, but we have lots of them. And, and sometimes I forget to blow them out. Yeah, that's not good. But you light them and it smells really awesome and then you go someplace else and you come back and you're like, oh, it smells good again. Adaptation. Okay, and it's a protection mechanism. Same thing happens with cold receptors and hot receptors. Sometimes you're in something very cold and it takes a while for you to feel comfortable in that temperature. Or the same thing with hot. They have the ability to do this as well. And again, that's called adaptation. It's protection mechanism for those cells. So that's a chemo receptor. That's a chemical sense. Understand the makeup. Understand that we can regenerate those cells. They don't follow all the rest of the neuron rules. The other chemo receptor we have is our gustatory response. And what's that? Our sense of taste. Same setup we saw in the olfactory region, in olfactory epithelium, we see in our taste buds or the gustatory region. So we have the same sort of setup, but now it looks like instead of flat, the setup is kind of looks like a garlic bulb. And the receptors are sandwiched between the supporting cells. We call the receptors who? The gustatory receptors. The taste bud is the whole garlic bulb. So the taste bud consists of the supporting cells, Again, we have basal cells. So what's that mean? Yep, we can make more of them. And it's a good thing. You ever go to the pizza parlor? Pizza comes to the table. You're really, really hungry. And you burn the hell out of your tongue. Well, you kill receptors. And you know it's going to happen. But you're so hungry and it smells so good. Right? Can you taste the rest of the pizza? No, because you killed your receptors. But luckily, eventually, you'll taste pizza again because you have the ability. Yeah. And, it, and what else? 
You smell. So basal cells here as well, same setup, supporting the neurons called gustatory cells. The dendrites of those neurons hang off at the end of the garlic bulb. So if I look at the surface of the tongue where I'm going to find these taste buds, I see the little garlic bulbs on these little papillae that we find covering the tongue. If you really get bored, they kind of look like mushrooms. One of them, the popular ones, are called fungiform papillae. What's fungi? What's a fungi? Mushrooms. So they kind of look mushroom-like. Circumvallate papillae down at the back. And then we actually have some a little bit further down on the tongue. Lingual and palatine regions, you have some taste buds as well. So these guys are where we have to get the chemical message. What covers your tongue to help dissolve the taste molecules that are going to fire these guys off? Spit, saliva. You're going to next week, oh, you're going to have fun in lab next week. This is a little bit of a torture lab. I enjoy it as well. But one of the experiments you're going to do is you're going to take, a, take your tongue. It's, uh, I should get my camera out for these labs because they're so much fun. Little torture, torture pictures. And you're going to dry it off. And then we're going to have you put some sugar on your tongue. And we're going to see how long it takes for you to start tasting it. It's going to take a while. Because what do you have to do in order to taste it? You have to dissolve it in the fluid. So you have to start salivating. And it's funny, you all say they go, because you have to time it. So it's important to be dissolved in a fluid, just like the mucus that dissolved the odorant molecules, the taste molecules that fire off these receptors need to be exposed to. Don't switch the thing yet. Hopefully it's not on your tongue. Usually it's on the side. Yes, on your tongue, on the side. What, is, what exactly is? It's kind of like a zit. You know, some of those pores get all blocked up, yeah. and you have to relieve the pressure so they can free up and. Yeah, yeah but they're on. They're not on your tongue. You have them on your tongue. Canker sores are usually down in, in the sides of the mouth for the. Yeah. Did you guys sign the um, uh, sign-in sheet? Make sure you do. Um, so yeah, chemo receptors, chemical sense has to be dissolved in a fluid. So, basic taste sensations very different from our sense of smell. We only have five: sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. What's a you mommy? It's not your mother. <laughs> um, amino acids in proteins give off or fire off these particular receptors, gustatory receptors, for taste. So it's like that beefy taste or the chickeny taste that's going to help. Yeah, kind of an irony taste almost is what this receptor is responsible for doing. Um, MSG, that food additive that sometimes bothers people, guess who it helps fire off more efficiently? Umami receptors. So it enhances the flavors of your food chemically. Is it good for you? No. Um, the science of taste is an amazing one as well. Um, anybody buy flavored waters? You know, you go and you go Poland Spring and you get the lemon essence and the orange essence. Is there any lemons or oranges in that water? Absolutely not. Just their essence. Okay, so it's, it's a chemical that takes the place of or elicits the same sort of response from these receptors. So what's, what are you better off drinking? Water. And if you want lemon essence, go get some lemon and squeeze it in the water. Right? 
Because all those things are, are chemicals. Not, I, I would bet thousands of dollars, no, it doesn't. And it might, a lot of the additives and preservatives and colors and chemical enhancers that there are in processed and packaged foods are petroleum-based derivatives. Did you know that? Yummy! There's nothing in nature that's blue like that. You know when you go, and, and every once in a while we get a birthday cake with the blue frosting on it? And I'm going to get disgusting, but it's true. Think about it. This is going in your body. So you eat the blue frosting, and everybody in the room always goes, because your tongue is like, bright blue. And when you're done processing that, and it comes out the other end, you probably know exactly what I'm going to say. Your, your poop is very interesting colors as well until you've processed your, your extremely fake blue frosting. So, yes, and that's a better way to, to add color to your food. And there are some really good organic to color your poop. Or eat asparagus and make your pee smell. But yeah, um, natural based colorings are much safer for you to use. And there's berries, blueberries, for example, or uh, beets. Beets are used a lot in food um, colorings. Okay? But it's more expensive, right? So if I'm going to make something cheap, I'm going to buy a big old honking bottle of chemicals and add a few drops instead of going to process beets to add my beautiful color. So it's all about the dollars and cents. So physiology of taste. Who is responsible for the gustatory pathway for processing in the cerebral cortex? Well, we have our friend the facial nerve, cranial nerve who? Seven. Seven. We have the glossopharyngeal cranial nerve. I don't remember. Nine. And then we have the vagus nerve, cranial nerve. Ten. Very good. All of these guys are responsible for sending message for your gustatory sense. Again, these are chemoreceptors. We see the pathway with these guys helping us out, sending message to the medulla oblongata through the pons into the midbrain regions and then the gustatory cortex or insula which is kind of on the side in the parietal and temporal regions. <coughs> so where do we smell? And anything that disrupts that pathway is going to disrupt our sense of smell. Yes? So we have our sense of sight or vision. We have our smell. We have our taste. Who's this? Hearing. Hearing is next. So our sense of hearing and balance, not just hearing, our response, uh, the inner ear is responsible for that. So the ear and the inner ear is for hearing and balance. So our equilibrium receptors are also found in the inner ear as well. So we have external ear structures. We kind of have a funnel. On the outside, mine are huge. Woo! See the funnel? What's it funneling? What is the stimulus for this response? Sound waves? Did you ever go to a rock concert? or I say rock concert because that's the kind of music I like, but a really loud concert of any kind. Do things like, I mean, if you're near the speakers, you, you, you can actually feel it, right? You come out of there and everything's ringing, right? So what kind of receptor is this? It's a mechanical receptor. It's a mechanical sense. And the, that physical movement is set up by sound waves that are going to create wave waves 
in your inner ear. So we're in the inner ear, when we get to that point, we're going to find fluid in there. And those sound waves, those, that physical movement of sound waves are going to hit the liquid in the inner ear and cause wave waves to happen. Just like anybody has ever seen one of those neat little wave machines moves back and forth and the waves form. That's what we're going to do with sound waves. So we need some way to collect them. Can you hear without that? The outer ear? Yeah, you can hear just fine. Yep. Yeah, it just you know, might, might be diminished slightly because you don't have a funnel. So the oracle or pinna, what's an oracle? Anybody know what an oracle is? Greek mythology. Yeah, well, they go to the towns and tell the stories to the people from one place to another, right? That's the oracle. They gather information and send it off. And your oracle or pinna is going to help you do that. Your lobules where you put your earrings, and that forms your funnel. And it funnels sound waves down the external acoustic meatus through the temporal bone. So where is all of this? Yeah, through your temporal bone. So that bone you see in the diagram is the temporal bone. And embedded in the temporal bone is your middle ear. And the middle ear is going to help me transmit those sound waves to the inner ear. With the help of a little covering on the outside called the tympanic membrane, that's actually like a drum head. So when the sound wave comes in, they're going to hit the drum. When they hit the drum, what happens to, when you hit a drum, what happens to the drum head? It vibrates. If I hit it hard, it's going to vibrate more. If I hit it soft, it's going to vibrate less. So the vibrations are then transmitted through the middle ear. And there's three little bones that are going to act like drumsticks to transmit the message. In the middle ear, we're going to find three bones called the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, or the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. The stirrup is this guy right here, and he sits on another little drum head. Behind that drum head, we're going to see the inner ear. So sound waves come in, hit the drum, cause the bones to move, the hammer, the anvil, the stirrup, or the malleus, incus, and stapes. Not necessarily. This might not be fully developed yet. This, the pharyngotympanic or auditory tube, sometimes referred to as the eustachian tube, is going to help equalize pressure in that cavity. Take the same drum. If I sit on it, now go hit it. Can you, is anything going to come out of that drum? Especially if I sit on it, right? Why? Because the pressure of me is going to stop it from vibrating. So I have to have a certain pressure inside that middle chamber in order for the vibrations to take place properly. Fluid is produced. It doesn't fill up that cavity, but it's produced for the cells around it to help nourish them, provide them protection, all of that good stuff. And the excess drains down the pharyngotympanic or eustachian tube into where? Into your mouth, or upper portion of your mouth. In younger children, sometimes the angle of this, before these bones really fully develop in their skull, can be a little bit off. So what happens to that fluid? Yeah, it ends up building up in here. Sometimes it can cause lots of problems with hearing. It can become infected. 
and that's the ear infection. Most of the time, the ear infection isn't an ear infection. It's just fluid building up in there. And, yeah, and if they have a problem, more of a problem, where the eardrum can actually burst due to the back pressure here, they put in something that looks like a little straw. And that's what tu tubes in your ears are. They're a tiny little tube that punctures through the eardrum and allows pressure to equalize on either side until this can develop properly. So where's your ceruminous glands? glands are here in the external acoustic meatus. You also have some hairs in there. What are, what's, what are they for? Keep debris out and you know, you don't want bugs crawling in there, right? It's true, it happens. So it has, and it, it, there's special chemi chemicals in your ear wax that are deterrents to insects. So that's why you produce it, so bugs don't crawl in your ear. I guess that tick didn't really mind. So, <clears throat> the, it can be damaged to anything, including the portion of the brain where the hearing is processed. So anything leading up to that can cause hearing loss. So if I have problems with my eardrum, if I have malformation of the bones, if I have any issues with the receptors that we're going to talk about in a minute, that can't, then I can't get the message to the brain for processing. So you did a couple of tests, and you, or you're going to do a couple of tests in lab to test some nerve conduction um, in different places. Your voice sounds different to you than to everybody else. Why? My, I'm shaking my head when I create my voice. So I'm causing extra vibrations when I'm talking to you. My vibrations coming from my mouth is what you're collecting. I'm collecting a combination of both. So that's why my voice to me sounds very different than it does to you. Because when I play my voice back, now I no longer have my head vibrations, right? I'm just getting the vibrations from my voice bouncing back at me. Make sense? <clears throat> okay, so the combination of those vibrations is what's going to allow us to hear. So these structures are very important for my sense of hearing. When we go behind the little area where the stapes is, and the little area where the stapes is is called the oval window we're going to find the inner ear. And the inner ear consists of two sets of canals. This top canal set over here are called the semicircular canals. These guys and the receptors at the bottom are going to help us with our sense of equilibrium. Over here on this end of the inner ear, we see this thing that kind of looks like a, um, a snail shell. It's called the cochlea. And the cochlea is where we're going to find receptors for our sense of hearing. This cranial nerve has two branches. Does anybody know what cranial nerve this is? Eight. Very good. You just kept going, you were going to guess it eventually. This is called the vestibulocochlear cranial nerve eight. And there's two divisions to the vestibulocochlear cranial nerve. The vestibular region here, which sends message for what? Equilibrium. What happens to the fluid when I do this? It moves around. You have three of these, right? Anterior, posterior, lateral. Yes? And when I do that, I move the fluid through those canals, I fire off receptors, and I send a message to the brain as to where I am in space. In the cochlea, who's going to get... That fluid wave is going to run through and help me fire off receptors to send a message through the cochlear branch of cranial nerve 8 to my brain for processing for hearing. All right. Good place to stop. Here's the scoop. Do you have a question? Yeah. Ask it. Uh, Good. So when sound comes in, does it go through the sinus or is that really down? A little bit of 
movement happens there, but those receptors really don't fire off. Well, the waves set up. So if you have a really, really loud sound, sometimes it can actually cause a reaction in you, can it? Okay, so here's the scoop. Let me get this on tape so when you listen to the recording again, you can hear it twice. We are going to finish this small bit of what's left in this chapter on Tuesday. So is there a quiz? I'm going to open it up on Tuesday. And you have to do it by Thursday. Yes? Okay. So the quiz will open up after class on Tuesday. You have until before class on Thursday to complete it online. Can you do portions of it? And then no. Do it all. And you have 15 minutes to do it. Okay? No. So now, the next thing. So we're, gonna, we're not going to take much time and cost to finish this. What are we going to do? We're not just going to go and say, okay, we're done. We're going to go on to chapter 16. Okay? And we might finish chapter 16 on, Thursday, on Tuesday. You are going to need your clickers for Tuesday. So I only give you a week of reprise on Tuesday. You must have your clicker in order for attendance to be taken for you. Where's the sign-in sheet? Sign-in sheet. Bring it down. If you didn't sign the sign-in sheet, make sure you sign it. Yes. 